So it was at an effective altruism global conference, the one in San Francisco 15 months ago, that I first heard rumors about what became Future Perfect. Dylan Matthews was there from Vox, and he'd written some articles about effective altruism, some favorable, some kind of uncertain for us, and he had was telling people that Vox had just gotten a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation to do something a little bit different in journalism. And what they'd gotten a grant to do was some journalism that stepped back from the news cycle and looked at the world through a different lens. And when they heard that opportunity, Dylan Matthews and his boss, Ezra Klein, who founded Vox, uh, jumped on it because they're both effective altruists and had been interested for a long time in the question of what if the news wrote about issues that are really important? Dylan describes this as an argument they occasionally had back when they were both at the Washington Post and covering procedural minutia in the Senate. And Dylan would say, is this really important? And Ezra would say, if we were covering what's really important, we'd never write about anything but malaria. Um, so I, I don't think that's quite true, but Future Perfect was certainly an attempt to strike out farther on the malaria side of the spectrum compared to everything else that exists in the news. Um, so I'm going to go through a couple things um, for a structure to this talk. First, what Future Perfect is, what we write about, um, how, what reactions we've gotten and what we've se seen so far. And then the second half of the talk is going to focus a little bit more on takeaways that I think are of particular interest to effective altruists. So how much good have we done? How do we know how much good we've done and what are some questions in that area? If you want to become a journalist, how do I think you can do good? If you wanted to make more things like Future Perfect, perfect happen, how would you go about doing that? Uh, and then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for questions. So first, what is Future Perfect? Future Perfect is journalism from an effective altruist lens. This is a little different than being, say, an effective altruist trade publication or being an explicitly effective altruist project to try and choose news stories based on the impact we think reporting that story will have on the world, although that is one of the many things that we think about. You can think about it as like sports journalism starts with the premise that their audience cares about sports and wants to learn what's going on in the world of sports. Business journalism starts with the premise that the audience cares about business. Uh, Future Perfect is an attempt at journalism that starts out with the assumption that the audience cares about what the most important questions in the world are, and that our job is to give some answers, raise some questions, and sort of advance that conversation. Uh, so what have we covered? Um, we've covered global health and development, new studies in that area, and analyses of old studies in that area to present our understanding of the consensus. We've written about microfinance and the reasons to think it works, but not as well as everybody thought it might when they started working on it. We've written about cash transfers. We've written about new studies looking at spillover effects from Give Directly's work. We've looked at graduation programs, which have been benchmarked against cash and found to be a promising way to help the ultra poor. We've written about animal welfare. We've done coverage of problems on factory farms. You might think there's so many coverage on there's so many problems in factory farms that what does coverage do? But often there's a particular expose or a particular change in rules that lets us highlight that. Um, we've covered the rise of plant-based meat alternatives, which is something that a lot of effective altruists are excited about as a way of providing people with things they like to eat without the problems associated with factory farming. We've covered existential risks, both with some big articles that explain the broad case for caring, say, about AI or about biosecurity, and with some more news articles articles that just cover the advances in AI as a field and how someone might think about them if their concern is for the big future. We have a podcast which has had two seasons so far. Season one highlights lots of interesting weird ideas for making the world better, um, pulling on some things that I, I think are rarely discussed even in EA circles and it's a great introduction to lots of different ways of answering the question, how do we do a lot of good? Season two is a little bit different and it looks at philanthropy and what money does. So the ways that people who donate money have been able to shape the values of the movements they donate to for good and, and sometimes for bad. Uh, the ways that donors have been able to raise an issue to mainstream attention uh, when it was previously not taken very seriously. I don't know what season three will be about, but we want to continue answering questions that are interesting to effective altruists. The newsletter comes out twice a week. Uh, the three authors of Future Perfect write introductions to it. Sometimes those are things that we're interested in. Sometimes they're more link roundup focused, uh, but they're sort of a window into what we're thinking about when we pick articles for Future Perfect. Uh, we write about 
three to four articles a week on a busy week, sometimes five. Uh, the pace is actually one of the things that really took me aback when I started writing for Vox. Actually, about a week before I started, somebody pointed out to me on Vox's website that a particular author had written six articles. And they were like, Kelsey, are you going to have to write six articles? And I said, wow, I, I hope not. I can't write six articles. I, they, they probably would have told me if they expected me to write six articles. We spent an hour or so going through all of Vox's writers and checking how many articles they'd written in the last week. And I was relieved that most of them, it was more a manageable three or four. Um, and Future Perfect has a slightly slower pace than the rest of Vox because we have a broader area we cover um, and we need to know a lot about more distinct topics. But we still write a lot of content. Um, and I think that's been really good for me as a writer to get to delve into so many different things and to sort of be required to turn out articles about so many things. It stops me from putting article after article in my drafts to wait until I feel like it's perfect, which means it never comes out of my drafts. Um, but it means that there is a lot of future perfect content out there. Um, so then the next thing that you might want to know, well, I, I have some of the articles that we've covered. This is just a random day, the day my slides were due, the front cover of Future Perfect, and it just shows some of the variety of content that we cover, um, from the novel in economics to some stuff about how pigs are smart, uh, a UBI experiment, a map that helps you figure out where you can find plant-based meat, um, and a whole lot more. Um, and we've gotten some really positive reactions, including from some important people, to Future Perfect's coverage. One of the great things about Vox as a venue for Future Perfect is that Vox is taken pretty seriously by policymakers. Uh, Barack Obama recommended some of our articles. Um, senators often share articles that we write about their policy and about policy issues that they find pressing. So it's a great way to get EA ideas into the national conversation and to get lots of people talking about them and reading about them who otherwise probably wouldn't. Um, so the next question is, looking back after a year, what has surprised us? And I'd say I've been surprised by a couple of things. One of them is the, just the reach that Future Perfect has had. Millions of people read our more popular articles. Um, recently, I had an article about the backlash against um, plant-based meat that reached 2.5 million viewers in a couple of days and left me going like, wow, that's, that's so many people. Um, there's a lot of interest in these issues, and there's a lot of appetite for coverage, which is some, in some ways really exciting because it means that there is space for more things like Future Perfect and space for Future Perfect to grow. And it means that there really are lots of people who want to read about these topics of interest to EAs. And so while EAs are a huge part of our audience and we take really seriously the perspectives of the EA community on what we're doing, I think we're also reaching way beyond the EA community. That's both really powerful and honestly a little bit scary because it means that lots of people's only knowledge of EA perspectives and topics might be coming from Vox's Future Perfect. And so you might be asking, are, are you guys careful enough about what you're conveying to everybody about EA? And actually, one of the reasons Future Perfect is called Future Perfect is because we didn't want to call it effective altruism Vox or anything like that. Both, I think the EA community didn't want that because then Future Perfect would represent the EA community to lots of people who wouldn't have other interactions with it even more strongly. And Vox didn't want to do that because while it's an EA lens we're using to look at the world, it's a journalistic project um, and not a project that's explicitly designed to write articles that will do the most good. And so that degree of separation allows us the sort of editorial independence that's important for journalists and allows you guys some assurance that even if we get things wrong, nobody's going to come away with the impression that that's what effective altruism is all about. That said, I think a lot of people do associate Future Perfect with effective altruism, so this problem is still there and, and not a solved one. A particular detail that surprised me is the enthusiasm for articles about the scientific process and the replication crisis. Um, so I write about lots of stuff. Uh, you get a sense for which things get a lot of page views. Global health and development articles tend not to. They're really important. I'm really glad they're part of what we write, but they don't tend to have the reach beyond you know the 10,000 or so reliable people who will read almost everything we write. If you're one of those 10,000 people, you're great. You're, you're some of my favorite people in the world, <laughs> 10,000 of my favorite people in the world, but you know. Um, 
Uh, but people who aren't my mom and don't read everything I write tend to be less likely to read the global development articles, more likely to read about plant-based meat, AI does pretty well, and then there's just a ton of interest in the process of science. Uh, this was surprising to me because this whole narrative I'd heard about the replication crisis was that one of the problems was everybody wants to read about this flashy new study claiming that, you know, men like women who wear high heels is one article that got retracted this week. And then not that many people want to read a boring article that says, actually, that was a statistical mistake and there's no effect here. But as far as I can tell, this isn't true. People love reading the, actually, that was a statistical mistake article. I think it makes them feel kind of smug. You know, even scientists who, who peer review their articles and put them in journals, still half the time, they, they, they were just wrong. So I actually think, and you know, there are some great people covering the replication crisis at lots of different different outlets. I actually think there's a huge appetite for more coverage of this type, and I'm hopeful that as a result there will be more coverage of this type and we'll see more um, retractions getting as much airtime or more airtime as the original study did. So that's one really cool thing that's come out of Future Perfect that I hope sort of spreads across the media industry. Um, so now I want to move on to the second half of this talk, which is takeaways for effective altruists from Future Perfect. And I want to start by sort of talking a little bit more about the relationship between Future Perfect and EA. I'm an effective altruist, Dylan's an effective altruist, Ezra's an effective altruist. We're doing this because we think it has potential to do a lot of good. But we don't want um, Vox to just be serving as an outlet for existing EA organizations or for the EA community. We'll direct people to GiveWell for as long as we think that GiveWell is the best place to direct them. If it turned out that GiveWell was fraudulently buying yachts or something, then we would uncover in detail all the signs of that. So a little bit of independence lets us do journalism um, and hopefully be a, a voice for accountability if that's ever needed with the EA community. And as a result, Future Perfect is not an EA project. But I think a lot of EAs are still really interested in the question of like, is Future Perfect doing good? Should we give it money? Should there be more things like Future Perfect? Should I be a journalist and do something like Future Perfect? So I'm gonna talk about all those questions, but Vox isn't necessarily just using those questions to make decisions about what Future Perfect is doing. It's one of lots of considerations at Vox with the priority being doing good journalism. So is Future Perfect doing any good? Um, easiest way to measure this is to call up our friends at GiveWell and say, hey, of the people who, when they donate to um, give well charities and give a reason in the box that it gives you to give a reason, how many of them cite Vox and Vox's coverage? Um, and the answer is quite a few of them. Um, some, something like $250,000 were moved that way last year. And since not everybody who donates to give well donates to give well and through, through their site, or who, some people donate directly to recommended charities, and since not everybody who donates through the site fills out that box, it's probably a substantial underestimate of like, how much money do people move to give well top charities because of the work done by Vox is Future Perfect. I was super excited when I heard this. It made me really, really happy. It's a lot more money than I'm ever going to be able to donate, so it's super cool that um, that might be affecting it. Uh, there's a bunch of, that's the 2018 numbers, and Future Perfect launched in October of 2018. Most donations come in November and December. That's when people make their donation decisions, so I think this is somewhat attributable to Future Perfect, but it's clearly not purely attributable to Future Perfect, and the 2019 numbers, when they come in, which they haven't yet, will be a little bit more decisive. Um, but on its own, that's sort of like the starting point for the case that we're doing something worthwhile. And I think suggests that doing something like Future Perfect at an outlet that doesn't have a lot of readership overlap with Vox um, could be really valuable because you could reach those audiences and tell them about giving opportunities and stuff like that. From here, we're venturing into more speculative territory. Um, some stories about how Future Perfect might be doing good, which I'm very unsure of. Uh, I think these might be happening. I don't know how much of an effect they have, and if it turns out five years from now that I am up here and I'm like, actually, this one didn't pan out at all, and we don't think Future Perfect had any impact down that avenue, I'm sure that'll be true of at least some of these. But one is, maybe it's good for the broader American public to be exposed to the concept of thinking about the world in kind of the way 
way effective altruists do. That is in a pretty consequences focused way, in a way that when talking about a charitable intervention talks a lot about how well it works and how strong the evidence base for it is. Um, in a long-termist way that talks about big long-term problems and writes articles assuming that we care about the far future, that we care about future generations, and even that we're very sure extinction is bad and we should probably try to avoid it um, because there's a lot of discussion that just doesn't really take a strong stance on questions like those. So maybe there's some benefits to just making a broad population population of millions of people think about those ideas a little bit. Maybe they'll be a little bit more likely to go look other things up. Um, and then a sort of separate argument, but that I think is pretty related to that, is maybe of those million people, some of them, future perfect will be the connection that they needed to make to then go do lots of effective altruist stuff. Um, future perfect will lead them to buy a book uh, written by Toby's, like the one he talked about earlier today, or Stuart Russell's new book, which we're going to have an article up about next week, um, or they're going to go to the EA forum or an EA site or 80,000 hours and get much more into the community and maybe five years from now we'll be able to say hey are there some people in this room because of future perfect and there will and that would be a really great cause for case for what future perfect did and again that would imply we should have future perfect in areas with different audiences than vox um, in areas where we don't have something like that just to reach the people who will be excited about effective altruism once they've heard about it Another story is that in a couple areas, publicity is what matters and Future Perfect can provide it. Plant-based meat is sort of the strongest case for this. So there's been a big upsurge in interest in plant-based meat alternatives um, over the last year. Beyond Meat went public, Impossible Foods raised a lot of money, both of them expanded to grocery stores and restaurants across the US and the UK. Apparently here in the UK, you guys are getting the Impossible Whopper by the end of the year. It made a huge splash in the US, so I'm, I'm sort of hoping for the same reaction everywhere else because that really drives further adoption by competitors and other companies. Um, all of that leads to more people having heard of plant-based meat products and therefore asking about them at, at restaurants. That leads to more restaurants including them. So publicity is like a part of a virtuous cycle that maybe will result in a substantial portion of meat consumption being replaced by plant-based meat. So Future Perfect has covered this because it's newsworthy. Um, it's involved a lot of big companies and a lot of big product decisions. And by covering it, maybe we've contributed to that publicity and done some good that way. Um, and maybe there's a similar thing in other areas. Maybe charities benefit a lot from coverage that that um, directs people to their site and directs people to learn about what they're doing. Maybe there's a way to affect issues like AI with coverage that um, brings more attention to the issue and then creates publicity around change. Hesitation, maybe publicity is bad in a lot of EA areas. Um, I've heard this concern voiced most when it comes to AI and to biosecurity. With biosecurity, the concern pretty straightforwardly being maybe it's just a bad idea to single boost that this is a powerful way to hurt people. Um, with AI, the argument is usually a bit more complicated and it's like there's a simplistic narrative about AI which is that like tech companies are probably gonna do something stupid and we should regulate them before they do. And then there's a much more complex narrative about AI which is like any group developing it, whether they are a tech company or a government or a nonprofit, is going to run into some very hard to solve technical problems, which will probably produce bad results, even if we have regulations in place that seem to us to be very conservative. Um, and so the worry is if we accidentally push lots of people to believe the first thing, and then it turned out that we needed them to believe the second thing, maybe we end up being obstructive burning um, public approval and causing problems. So publicity, very powerful tool for good, also a very powerful tool for causing problems. Um, I hope we're doing more good than causing problems, but this is actually something where I really want to be in tune with the uh, opinions of the EA community. So if you read an article and you're like, this feels like more of a problems article than a good article, I really value getting emails about that and sort of getting people's perspectives on where it's helpful to have more emphasis and energy and attention and where it's easy to be counterproductive with that. Um, 
So throughout this, I've kind of been touching on this last question. What more can be done in this space? Um, but that's a question I've been asked a bunch of times this weekend. It's like, if, would it be good if Future Perfect was twice as big? I think it would be good if Future Perfect was twice as big. I think we don't yet cover all of the stories that are in our purview and interesting and relevant to us that come up, and that's partly because we only have three writers, and um, we would benefit from having more people who could cover those areas in more depth. I think we could also take more chances on slightly weirder stories or stories that take longer to report um, or require more like on the ground reporting if we had more people. Um, so Future Perfect will take your money and could benefit from being bigger. I have talked a little bit about how in addition to that, I think things like Future Perfect in other organizations could do a lot of good, especially to the extent those organizations don't have a lot of overlap with Vox. Um, Vox was founded by Ezra and Matt Iglesias, two pretty well-known, pretty liberal pundits, and Ezra result, while it's not like officially ideological or anything, it's pretty associated with US liberal politics. And I would think it would be pretty cool to have something like Future Perfect in lots of organizations with lots of ideological bents and audiences, because that reaches a wider range of people, a wider range of perspectives. I think you could have something like it outside the United States, and that would be pretty cool. Um, another question I get asked sometimes is, what if we had something that was like Future Perfect um, and not part of Vox, like just an independent news organization that wrote from an EA perspective and was EA sort of top to bottom. Um, I think this would let you do some cool stuff. You could have in-depth coverage of things like who was appointed to chair EA organizations and stories about like features of EA organizations and organizations that want to be considered EA. You could sort of get into a lot of detail that you can't at Vox because Vox's philosophy is that every article should be accessible to a smart reader with no prior background. And there might be a lot of space for articles that require some background, but that can, as a result, get readers much more into the depth of a topic than we can. On the other hand, there are some huge advantages to being associated with a major national publication that's also known for its Trump coverage and its impeachment coverage and its Game of Thrones coverage. And that's just the, the number of people you can reach and the sort of pre-existing expertise in how to do journalism and how to reach a lot of people people. So while I'd be interested in somebody setting up something like that, um, I think it requires a ton of expertise to do right, and it requires a ton of expertise to write things that people want to read. And I feel really lucky that Future Perfect sort of found itself at Vox, where a lot of that expertise was pre-existing. So that's an overview of what I do, and I wanted to leave the rest of the time for questions. In addition to questions now, I have office hours starting half an hour after this talk ends, and you can totally come to that and ask questions too. In fact, some questions you maybe should ask then, since this is video recorded and that's not, so um, I can get into more detail on some things. Thank you all so much. I wanted to start by just kind of talking about the the funding and, and the business model, if there mm -hmm. is one. Um, I guess I don't know this for sure, but I assume that the, the kind of normal ad revenue that Vox makes applies to Future Perfect content as well, or is that not the case? So Future Perfect was funded for its first year by a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation, um, and that paid for hiring a couple of new writers, moving Dylan to writing about Future Perfect full-time instead of the sort of politics beat that he was on before, um, a social media manager, and an editor. And the Rockefeller Foundation is not renewing this grant for the next year. They, they weren't like super unhappy with us or anything, but it was kind of a stretch outside of what they normally did. Um, and we're working instead with some funders who I think um, I, I am not able to share very many details, but this will all be announced publicly pretty soon. Um, will enable Future Perfect to continue going um, in basically the same vein for the next year. Um, and we're open to sources of funding, both from people who care about it from an EA perspective and like the Rockefeller Foundation wasn't particularly EA. Um, there are sort of advantages and disadvantages to both models. We probably would not take funding from like the Center for Effective Altruism or from the Open Philanthropy Project directly because that would interfere with uh, us feeling like, well, with readers feeling like we felt free to say whatever we thought, and p possibly with us feeling like we felt free to say whatever we thought. But um. so, is there revenue though that comes in? I mean, the the, the general Vox business model is ad supported, right? Yes, and Vox does make money off the ads from Future Perfect, but that's sort of um, separated from what we do. So, like Future Perfect uh, doesn't 
rely on getting a certain number of page views to keep existing. Um, and when we do get lots of page views, that's just a bonus for Vox's main business, I guess. Gotcha. Um, so it's you're, from a business perspective, you're totally isolated from the ad-supported business model. Yeah, um, and that's been meaningful because there's page view targets um, for a lot of departments at Vox, and um, we have a lot less pressure to write whatever will yeah. get the most page views. Although, you still want people to read your stuff, and so page views are still pretty important. Yeah, of um, course. Do you have any sense for how, if you were not insulated from that pressure, whether the traffic that you're getting would be enough to support the operation as it exists today? I think if there hadn't been grants, um, there was definitely plans to keep the, the writing team from Future Perfect. I think probably we would shift in a direction that had, you know, maybe less of our stories that don't perform as well and more of our content in like AI and plant-based meat that's been really promising. Um, but certainly we write a lot of stuff that does very well by Vox's standards too. Cool. Um, so on that note, how do you think about finding and selecting and developing stories? I mean, one that stood out to me from the podcast series was the one about the more humane and ultimately kind of better for the food production angle as well, uh, method of killing fish. Yes. Kind of out there. So yeah, where do you find this stuff? A lot of flexibility. If you have something that you think is sort of related to EA that I could write about, you can just email me, um, Kelsey Piper at Vox. Um, and a lot of this I do find just by reading the EA forum, by reading a lot of journals, by talking to a lot of people who are doing stuff, and then picking things that are interesting or that like exemplify a concept that we should be thinking about. Like with the more humane method of fish slaughter, I wouldn't say that's very important in itself, but it gets people thinking about the question, do fish suffer? Given that fish suffer, do we have obligations to sort of change how we process fish? Um, are there ways to dramatically reduce fish suffering and what would they be? And you know, those are questions that we want people thinking about if they've never thought about them before. Um, couple of very practical questions coming in from the audience. One about just writing in other languages beyond English, is that an area that you guys have interest in? I think it would be super cool if that existed. Um, Vox doesn't have the expertise to do it in-house, but I would be really excited about people starting things like Future Perfect um, in other languages. It seems like you could do a lot to bring similar concepts to other audiences that way. Um, and another question about different forms of media. You guys obviously have columns mm -hmm. uh, in kind of the blog format as well as the podcast. Have you given any thought to expanding into, into other forms, or do you have other types of media that you think could be fruitful that people might want to consider? So Vox has a pretty big video team and produces a lot of content for like YouTube, and I, I hear that lots of people mostly interact with the news and with ideas and speakers through YouTube. So I would be pretty excited if somebody was like, I want to start doing um, something like a YouTube for effective altruism. Both it would be exciting if Vox got the funding to do that, and it would be exciting if somebody here was like, yeah, I, I feel like I could like stream and talk about effective altruism. Um, I, I don't think I could personally do that. It sounds terrifying. But, you know, it would be cool. <laughs> well, don't sell yourself short. I think you've done an amazing job here uh, in front of this audience. So I'd love to see you uh, even maybe give the YouTube thing a shot one day. How about a round of applause for Kelsey Piper?